First question that I want to ask you, Shane, even though you and I have covered this on my podcast before, but just for anybody who is new and hasn't heard those conversations, can you talk about what Vanu is and the philosophy behind that? Sure. So, so Vanu is a freedom strategy and philosophy uh, developed by a guy pseudonymously named Rayo back in the 1960s. And uh, it's an awkward contraction of the words voluntary, not vulnerable. And uh, just, I guess, briefly defined, it's uh, um, pursuing the pursuance of lifestyle changes and pursu- or, or, or lifestyle changes in pursuance of, of freedom. So um, some of these would be uh, van nomadism, perpetual traveling, um, agorism would, would fit in there, financial independence, um, homeschooling, getting uh, you know, children out of the, the course of schooling institutions, certainly, uh, certainly an important one. Um, and then uh, things like intentional communities um, and ethical enclaves, um, so things, things like that. Um, but uh, basically, I guess that that's that's the the real the real brief um, the real brief definition before voluntarism really came about. Um, you know, the, the peaceful philosophy of voluntarism and non-aggression principle. He was already talking about all of these ideas. Um, I guess his his perception back in the 1960s. I mean, things obviously hadn't escalated this much, right. but he was, uh, I guess he viewed the world just kind of, kind of like how we, how we all three probably see it today, um, back in the 1960s. So he made all these radical lifestyle changes, um, but back at that time, but, uh, uh foundational Devon is it's not only, it's not only philosophy. Um, you know, philosophy is, is great and it's, it's critically important, but, um, there's a necessary duality of philosophy and practice. Um, those, you know, one without the other, um, isn't, uh, isn't great. You know, they're, they're both very, very critically important because they, they both influence each other. So he was very, very heavily focused on action and uh, um, obviously worked in some, some philosophy there. But um, that's been, that been, I guess, uh, been, been my focus. What I've been trying to put, push out there is, um, you know, ph- the philosophy of voluntarism and, and, you know, peace is fantastic. You know, it's critical. It's a critical foundation. But um, we have to start building something, you know, going towards something. And um, that's, yeah, that's kind of been, yeah, that's been, been my focus is, is, is a solution to trying to figure out how to go about uh, my own personal self liberation, and then also to this large network of people that's uh, you know we've all kind of we've we've got a large network of volunteers and 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 uh, you know venuans on the internet. Um, like let's start building something in, in physical space and time. So um, yeah, that's a little little bit on Vanu, and I guess kind of bringing it to, to relevancy today. Sure. And one of the things that I admired right from the beginning of encountering your work was a, a series that you did called Direct Action where you uh, spend a lot of time like, okay, we've outlined the philosophy of this. Here are like practical steps that you can take. That was part of your Liberty Under Attack podcast, which now mm-hmm. is just your publications platform. But I'm sure a lot of that is built into uh, Vanu as well. And you're yeah, doing it. Yeah, I mean, it's all, yeah. Yeah, it's all, I mean, it's, it's all the, I mean, it's, it's all the same thing, right? Personal freedom, self-liberation. It's, uh, it's things you, it's uh, anything you can do to increase your personal freedom without asking for permission. Um, that's the, the whole underlying thing. We aren't so, you know, that's why politics is out of the, out of the equation. Um, it, Vanu is completely a political direct action as, as I did, as I presented it a few years ago, is say political too. So it's all about uh, um, things we can do in the here and now um, to increase our personal freedom without, um, you know, begging, begging those who falsely imagine themselves to be our rulers or asking for permission. It's just not helpful. So like actually showing people what a prosperous and free life looks like kind of stripped of political presumptions, I think is, is a very mm-hmm. useful thing to do. And uh, you've done a, you've done a really good job, I think, of kind of separating your brand from, you know, an echo chamber of, say, like anarchist or voluntarist or uh, libertarian thought. So um, mm-hmm. I, I admire that very much about what you've done. Joe. The topic for today, like big picture, was intentional communities, and that's how the the Pansia is going to come into this. But can you guys talk a little bit about what you've done in Michigan and what you're trying to do in Michigan as it relates to that? Uh, So really, um, in terms of an intentional community, we're really just at the point of, in fact, this year at the Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest going to announce our long-term goal of establishing an intentional community as part as a PAS as part of the network with uh, with what Shane's doing over there, what we really found was number one we love being around people who a don't think we're utterly insane for every opinion that we speak, um, but also who again don't want to hurt us or take our stuff, and 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 really just that that feeling where you can be around those people uh, and when we come together at our event it's. Uh, it's such a recharge of the batteries, that feeling of, of real, live, actual freedom that we do not have in our daily lives. And 
Um, let's face it, 2020 was kind of a, um, a quick gut shot of, oh, wow, all of this can really go to shit in a big hurry uh, if somebody yanks the chain, you know, supply chain disruptions, everything else. Being around other people who know how to build things, fix things, and survive and, um, and provide for themselves and help with others uh, has tremendous value. And so really, we, we kind of decided that, hey, you know, this fest kind of comes and, and when it goes and it's over, everyone has this sort of downtime, this blues feeling and, uh, you know, it's, it's the post-fest depression. Well, what if we, what if we could live with those people? And, and what if we could kind of keep that thing going and, and, and we could cooperate with each other and we could have that as, as our lives. And well, look, here's Shane. He actually does it, right? Mm -hmm. he's, he's making it happen. And, and I think it's really cool. So our plan is to announce that as our, as our long-term goal of the event. That's what we're going to raise funds for. That's what we're moving toward. Uh, Shane, I wanted to do some terminology before we go any further. You have these mm -hmm. acronyms PAZ and TAZ, P-A-Z and T-A-Z, and you've also mentioned mm -hmm. um, first and second rounds in uh, this piece that you sent me and elsewhere on your website. So I just mm -hmm. want to get that clarified, what what all of that means as it relates to what, what Joe just kind of laid out. Sure. So PAZ is permanent. Is an acronym for permanent autonomous zone, and TAS is short for temporary autonomous zone. Um, so basically, they're uh, places where we can have our autonomy ex exercise our autonomy, um, in a temporal sense. Whether it's temporary, like a like a freedom festival, like a weekend, or whether it's something permanent, like uh, like a PASNIA. As far as PASNIA, that's the that's where the inspiration for the name came from. PAS is short for uh, you know permanent autonomous zone, and it's also uh, means peace in Spanish. But the first realm and the second realm. Uh, first realm is a society that does not respect self-ownership or individual liberty, uh, but rather heralds the supremacy of government and authority. Uh, in other words, it upholds the collective as superior to the individual. Um, and its foundation is coercion. That's the most important distinction. Or only thing I need to know, have you forsworn the use of coercion? That's it. Um, mm -hmm. That's it. And you also have to be vetted. Um, so that's another, another – I can talk more about that um, later on. But um, So that's the first realm. Um, and the second realm, to contrast – the best definition I've found is from a, a crypto agorist novella that we uh, have on the uh, have via Liberty and Tech Publications called Hashtag Agora. Um, but uh, um, the author there says, quote, Techni uh, technically, the second realm is described as encrypted communication, encrypted currencies, anonymous and pseudonymous identities, and untraceable action. So um, the more mo the, I guess the more modern way I'm thinking about uh, about about the second realm um, or the way I'm explaining it is most people are, are familiar, familiar with agorism, um, counter economics. Well, that's um, that's. Um, exp exp uh, what we're doing with you know with Pasnia, um, what the second realm does is it expands the agora to include uh, living a liberated culture, uh, our own infrastructure, things like off-grid electricity, um, mesh networking, et cetera, uh, and incorporating volume and security culture principles. So we have a, we have a Pasnia constitution. Obviously, we're a free republic, so we naturally have to have the constitution and a declaration of independence. So that was my but, next uh, <laughs> question is like uh, what kind of a – yes, everybody comes together on these principles, but is there some kind of accountability or binding agreement? So yeah, I'd love to hear – and Joe, I know you're thinking about that too, so if you have anything on that after Shane, please let us know. But uh, yeah, talk a little bit more about the contract, constitution, binding agreement. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, so one of the major issues in potential communities is, is dispute resolution. And, and I'm just thinking about this now, but we've kind of counteracted that from the start because – um, last year, I, I had something. It was, this is the, what started what started the whole idea for Pazzi, but was was Vanu Fest, um, something I decided to put together last year. Um, but I, I live out here, and you know, like uh, um, you know, I practice Vanu security culture principles. Um, you know, like using pseudonyms. We recommend people sign the constitution using a pseudonym. Um, so the people that I invited out here for the first Vanu Fest were all people, like basically the third people that came out were people I've been going to the Midwest Peace Liberty Fest with for like six years. So there's no, there's like, for, for with these folks, there's not a need for like a dispute resolution at this point. Like, I've, we've kind of already gone, gone around that to where um, only people that are like extremely vetted, um, not only for like, a, and we're not, ta I'm not really talking about betting like infiltrators, but um, people that you would want to live with like on a, on a daily basis, right? That you, that you know have forsworn these coercion and are going to fall back into, um, you know, those, those coercive tendencies tendencies of, of the first realm. But as far as the constitution, um, which is the, the founding principles of Pasnia, all it is is a respect for and commitment to privacy. The use of pseudonyms is encouraged. Don't hurt people and honor your contract. So there's the volunteerism right there. Um, a culture that encourages humanity to flourish rather than degrade and regress and a, rec a recognition of the important task ahead of us to ensure the continuation of freedom into the future, another way for those seeking a way out. So that's it. It's like 
um, that's the, 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 I guess the, the foundation is, is, is just that there's no, um, so you mentioned the, the political thing. I mean, I've, I've been doing the following podcast for years and I've interviewed quite a few, um, people that from the left-leaning persuasion that are, you know, doing incredible work in the realm of lifestyle changes, um, much more than, um, and not to just, just to draw a distinction, not to, to not to criticize or anything, but just to, to kind of point it out, like when it comes to anarcho-capitalism, um, you know, folks that would more be kind of more on the right, if anything, it's a lot more theory. So um, I appreciate, regardless of political political ideology or what, what people's beliefs are, what's their act, what, what are they doing? Um, and um, yeah, what are they doing? And are they doing it um, upon, you know, the foundation of peace, peace and voluntarism? And Joe, I'll throw to you because you guys have been at it quite a while in Michigan, right, with uh, Midwest Peace and Liberty. And I'm not just talking about the fest, but you have um, a fairly tight-knit community, even if it is not super tight-knit geographically. Uh, but I remember we did that great meetup at uh, Mike's house when I was traveling across the country in 2017. And I was so impressed with the number of people who showed up. And even though almost everybody w was in Michigan, they some had come from, like, quite a distance. So you've put together – a collection of you know personalities and everybody comes together around a philosophy which is good and obviously is you know not a promise of elimination of conflict as we've certainly seen i saw that in new hampshire you've seen that in michigan but there's a, there's a more pressing question here and i want to throw back to shane for this one the vanu podcast yeah intermission number 50 that you sent me from last august it was titled liberated mm -hmm. areas among the tyrannical wasteland that is a fabulous title yeah the tyrannical wasteland and just kind of going back to that first realm and the prioritization of collectivism over individualism what we've learned since last august uh is that really has no end in sight that really has no end in sight and uh, a lot of my content lately has been looking at this with thoughtful guests and saying, you know, where do you think this is going? And uh, as far as that first realm is concerned, none of us have uh, exciting predictions, right? Maybe exciting, not hopeful, right? And uh, that's, uh, that's kind of a long road ahead of mainstream society in that way. So the idea of a liberated area, as we see an encroachment of authoritarians escalating at a rate that I have never witnessed in my lifetime, how does one establish a liberated area at this point? Like we could go back, like you, you know, you talked about the origins of this in the 1960s. And I think, yeah, maybe given the context of the time and people could only see that far, uh, there were things happening in the United States in the 1960s. There, there were uh, a group of at least young men who were being, you know, taken into the custody of the government, given forced inoculations, sent to Southeast Asia, forced to kill people. Um, that was in, in the age of television, like when that all happened before in the 40s, it was a very carefully managed thing. But seeing stuff like that on television, obviously the civil rights movement, um, a large interest in the population, not feeling like uh, you know their dignity as individual human beings was being honored and it certainly wasn't so yeah in the late 1960s the world was there, there were these kind of ominous signs that the united states was going in a very very bad direction and i'm only listing a couple of examples today mm -hmm. there has been a significant intensification over that and uh while in the 60s yeah people could have broken off and uh started a, a commune there was there was actually just to throw this in there a really beautiful movement across a, a, a belt of the northeast into the midwest in the mid 19th century, which is how you get like uh, all of these uh, intentional communities, and uh, some of them often become these kind of weird utopian societies. But uh, you know, even the Walden idea is a part of of that movement. So, what was possible in the middle of the 1800s, and what was possible even in the 1960s, as far as like communes or breakaway societies, uh, by the 1990s, if a group of people wanted to get together and just kind of live on their own and do their own thing, uh, they, they had a good chance of, um, you know, being firebombed by that point. And, and that's not to, like, let the Branch Davidians off the hook like they did nothing wrong, but they certainly didn't deserve that fate. So that was uh, certainly kind of a, a, a turning point uh, in an astute American, certainly one who valued independence, got the message by the 1990s. You know, Ruby Ridge was another example of this, where it's like, hey, you are our property. You are government property. You're not going to go off on your own and do your own thing. The 1990s, 
Waco, Ruby Ridge, those were the good old days, it seems, compared to now. And I hope I'm not being too cynical. So that's a long lead in to the question of, like, how could you possibly establish a liberated area in this uh, degree of tyrannical wasteland? It's a great question. It's a great question. And if it was down to, you know, one spot in, in the world where we all congregated, um, that would be problematic, you know, central point of failure to speak in, te- in te- technological terms. Um, to bring in another technological term related to, to I guess, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is decentralization. Um, the idea here is, is a network of these things where if one goes down, it's, it's, it's irrelevant to the whole, um, that these things are, you know, all over and so pervasive that, um, you know, if, uh, uh, if you know, there's uh, bad security culture practices at one, um, they face the, the ramifications, uh, they face the, the coercion, and hopefully it doesn't, you know, seep into, um, you know, the, the larger network. But, um, I mean, yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly, I've been, I guess I'll, I'll say politically aware just for, for like a better a word off the top of my head, um, since I was like 18 or 19 and I was blown away by how, how quick things progressed, uh, progressed last year, which is one, one motivation for putting this entire thing together. Um, so there's also just that where there's, it's, it's kind of, yeah, there's, there's risk to it, but there's also risk to doing the things you have to do to be a part of that society. Right. Um, so it's kind of to a point now, like do something or not. And and the way that I see it, so I was I was I was you know running through it th- this morning as a thought experiment too. I mean, we've got so many people all over, um, all over the world. Like I've got people who follow Paznia from from Europe. You know these these you know Berlin cypherpunks. So like it's we've got these places all over the world. We've got these allies everywhere. Um, I don't think it's it's out of the realm of possibility at all to put together a um, you know um, not for the general public, but um, for people who are part of the second realm network, the Paznia network, who have been vetted. Um, they have access to this map, to this directory of um, places where they can go and um, where they never have to interact with the first realm. They don't need um, they don't need to go to the grocery store for food. They don't need to go to Babylon Pharmaceuticals for their health needs, because here at Veritas Pasnia, we've got uh, um, we've got, uh, you know, right healing devices or something like that. Right. Mm-hmm. So like we're we're, getting, we're 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 talking about building alternatives to every single human institution. And obviously these things are are, are important, um, whether it's, you know, food. Um, health, energy, um, all of these things. So, um, yeah, you, it's it's intentional community, of of course, but it's it's a lot bigger than that. So that um, we're we're trying to build this this overarching network, and not only just build it to you know survive and and to thrive, but to to eventually, hopefully, um, you know, just uh, um, re- replace the first realm. Um, people yeah. see how efficacious it is, and and uh, um, and you know, I don't know. I mean, I I, I couldn't foresee this getting to, getting to this point. So, um, I'm not you know holding back possibilities. Uh, Personally. That's amazing. So right, it's, it's, it's very interesting because – so you're, you're approaching like 30 years old, we'll say. You've been at this for 10, 12 years. Uh, you and I have talked that one of your introductory points was Bill Cooper. Uh, so you're certainly primed. Which has become relevant again. Yeah, yeah it became yeah, relevant. Yeah. Full, full circle again. Yeah, I, never, yeah. I didn't think that, but yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, and even you were surprised. We, you know, I opened the conversation by saying, like, man, Shane, Shane was on to this uh, a while ago. But I certainly reflect on last year thinking, like, how ill-prepared emotionally I was for, for what happened in a lot of ways. And kind of kind of missed a lot of important cues that I that I should have looked at for for skepticism, at least in the you know the first six to eight weeks of um, what happened. Uh, so so yeah, I just think that's 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 really interesting that even Shane was uh, surprised. Well, I actually wanted to circle back to your previous question about oh, uh, please, talking, yeah. ab- talking about the risks. I mean, you a few years back, you drove across this country, right? Mm-hmm. Well, and you may have noticed. There's a lot of places where it's really, really far in between everything else. There are places where people live in in communities and or even on their own, and they don't have to see or interact with anybody else. Even here in in Michigan, you know, I live in the Metro Detroit area, but you go up to the northern part, and even throughout all of 2020 and you know lockdowns, masks, and you know, all that stuff, there were plenty of places where. Life pretty much plotted along as normal, and 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 you know things are a little more isolated from this um, from this first realm. Now, granted, they're certainly not perfect, but it's a big place. There's a lot of space, and not to mention that um, I also live in a place where there's a whole lot of fresh water that's super easy to get a hold of. So, um, I, I think that's always one of the big crucial things. No matter where you go, you got to have water, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is something that I actually think about a lot, right? Like the real physical America 
versus the America that I view through my computer screen. Uh, perception management is really, really strong. So I, I've been looking into the, I don't know, it's been, it's been a major driver the past few years to reverse my so-called type 1 diabetes. So I've been very, very, very much focused on health. Um, the, um, you know, this was just kind of, uh, I guess, in- interesting timing. I've already, I was already starting down, you know, research path. Uh, you know, the, 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 viral vers- the virus versus terrain theory, as you, as you have uh, talked about in your podcast, Brett. Perception management, like uh, if you think about how, how prevalent or how prevalent and pervasive cancer is um, in the U.S., and then you hear that, you know, just across the border in Baja, you can go get, um, like, you can get, like, it's a 30% chance, like, reversal rates of, of so-called cancer. Um, but you wouldn't know about that in the States. You would think your only, your only option is to go through, you know, like, what, you know, what pharma would, would, would present you with, right? Um, you know, obviously, it's, it's cliche at this point, but this is late-stage empire. We are seeing a, a collapse, a decline. Um, yes, they will harm and hurt and steal and do a lot of awful things before they go down and they'll, they'll take a lot of people with them, but they can't get everybody. Um, and the more spread out you are, the, and, and part of what Shane does and that philosophy, that invulnerability, not vulnerable to, to coercion, um, making yourself a difficult target, you know, not being the softest target, not being that person sitting in a major city center relying on these, um, you know, government controlled supply chains for all of your sustenance, for all of your survival, for all of your entertainment, um, you know, that, um, that makes you a harder person to control. And for many cases, they say, man, it's just not worth it to go after all these people. I don't think we can do it. Um, yeah. Make it difficult. Yeah, so I had a uh, a really great conversation with uh, Ben Stone, the Bad Quaker, maybe like five years ago, and I think the title of the episode. Mm-hmm. There's a video of it on my YouTube too, just a little highlight. But it's called "Creating a Market Demand for Liberty," and you know what Ben put out there is he's like, right now because of a kind of philosophic corruption, there is a huge market demand for coercion, and coercion solves every problem. So I'm kind of trying to figure out as I look forward at the next two, four, five years, what responsibility should I feel given my skills and my platform or, uh, you know, the, the good faith that I've built with a fairly large number of people, what responsibility should I feel as long as it doesn't translate into like a self-sacrificial practice to, um, expand that market demand for the things that we're talking about. So people who do understand a kind of uh, peaceful practice of communication people who are clear thinkers, people who feel like they are not participating with friends or family uh, to win arguments or seek their approval, but feel like they have something to actually contribute to other people. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of wondering, like, what is the sense of responsibility I should feel to not at this point, produce counter narratives. I think counter narratives are kind of a lost cause, right? Because people are given these these heuristics or these shortcuts or these caricatures of, you know, you you say something that's off the mainstream media script and they go, oh, you're like Tucker Carlson or Alex Jones or you're an anti-vaxxer or you're a conspiracy theorist. And there's a there's there's a two word way to dismiss you. So instead of that, like inspiring thought, inspiring curiosity, as you're right, Joe, that metaphor of the, the squeezing hand more and more people are going to be like, geez, it's tight in here. That was one of my hopes right from the beginning with this thing. Last spring, I was saying, or you know, spring 2020, I was saying that. like, People are going to feel the grip, and what are they going to do? And I might not be able to say, hey, I've been telling you about this uh, all along. Not that I knew this was coming, but inspiring curiosity, inspiring skepticism, I think that might be the best route to continue to – like it's a little late for seed sprinkling. But as the saying goes, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago and right now. And I kind of did both. And I'm kind of trying to think about, you know, at this point, it's still worth doing. But to both of you, do you still feel some responsibility of outreach, not just to other people that you care about? Or are there still people in your life who, you know, even need this kind of outreach uh, or responsibility to yourself or responsibility to this philosophy as as a kind of defensive measure. Yeah, so um, what I've always thought was most efficacious, I've never tried to reach like an audience at large. I've always been kind of kind of like a, for good or for worse. Um, for the first few years of my, of my time in alternative media, I was pretty divisive towards political crusaders and things. 
And, but, uh, you know, really it's inspiring through action. Um, and what I'm trying to do here, you know, Veritas Pasnia. So that's so the free country is Pasnia. And then we've got cities. So Veritas Pasnia is here. You know, like I want this to be a, like a demo, like a, demo, a demonstration of, of what one of these second realm knows, um, what, what another Pasnia could look like. Um, and really, I think what's, what has been most influential for me over the past year and a half is uh, realizing how much of my reality was wholly constructed um, and not actually like like wholly constructed like the bookends of reality what's actually what's actually real um again like i i bring to mind uh um, you know inspiring through action like when the first realm um inevitably fails people um you know in the pharmaceutical realm like the second realm can step up and, and you know be that alternative um i think that's that's really the best method of outreach but um obviously like i still do uh the bonnie podcast i still do all your publications about books on amazon i still do outreach and, and, and outreach as i can um but uh you know i i think about just just over the past year and a half or a couple of years not the first you know five or six years of you know diving down rabbit holes there's so much context so much reading so much information necessary like to work to, to get where i've gotten that for someone to um like someone has to be incredibly dedicated like they have to have that soul level dedication to um you know pursue these things like it's right, not just yeah. something they can pick up and throw away so um i think the people that need the information will find it um i think like i've all, all the stuff on bonnie's out there every episode of lua is out there still um we just we we ensure you know through library and through ipfs and through all these things that these resources are always available and people will find them the people that need to find them will find them and um i think that's the best we can the best we can really do because unfortunately the, a lot of the survival society is just completely programmed so there's not much that we can we can do for a lot of folks but we that's i think that's what we can do on a positive awesome and shane the free public of pasnia pasnia.com we so obviously as i said people who come out here have already been vetted for like five or six years but you don't have to be that vetted for five or six years you just have to be vetted um so if you do want to come out to bonnie fest too um here at pasnia which is uh, september 27th october 4th come out to the npl fest first and then i can vet you there i can, can meet and, I, and, and get you the invite all that good stuff so um yeah pasnia.com that's for, for bonnie fest and then if you want to uh, become a stakeholder s-t-e-a-k it's, it's my little membership cooperative thing i've come up with but if you want to become a stakeholder there's the honorary which is more of the digital unvetted if you want to support and get some some cool things we have uh, you know again we're the free public it's naturally we have passports they look they look legit you can see pictures of them um we've got uh, you know pasnia ids pasnia flags and now um for this year's stakeholder we've got pasnia beach towels um for, for those who are really really into that sort of thing so yeah um i will be updating uh pasnia.com does have the i guess the, uh, the that is some of that information there from last year it will be updated in the next uh, next in the next couple few weeks um but yeah that's pasnia would love to uh, you know have more more individuals, you know, more individuals out here, and then also more more nodes in the network. Uh, so if you've got uh, you know property um, that uh, you know you'd, you'd like to start expanding outwards, um, you know, we'd, we'd certainly love to have you as part of the network. And again, security culture minded, um, all those sorts of things. We live here, like we don't need any, we don't need trouble from from coercers, public or private. So yeah, and, and then the other thing, but you know, I haven't done an episode in a little while, but uh, bonniepodcast.com is uh, the place to go for all, all paths and the updates go out there in audio format. So that's another, another place. Yeah.